and to those also listening in afterwards. Uh, I'd like to warmly welcome uh, our guests today, whom I'll shortly uh, introduce. Uh, but first, um, I would like to, uh, welcome, like I said, welcome everybody uh, and introduce you to FIP, who is hosting this event. Uh, FIP is an international organization uh, for um, pharmacists, pharmaceutical scientists and uh, pharmacy ac uh, academics. FIP's vision is a world where everyone benefits from access to safe, effective, quality, and affordable medicines and health technologies. Our mission is to support global health by enabling the advancement of pharmaceutical practice, sciences, and education. So welcome to this event on introducing the FIP Transforming Vaccination Globally, Regionally, and Nationally 2021, where we will be focusing on accelerating equity, access, and sustainability through policy development and implementation. So let uh, us first uh, introduce uh, ourselves. So I will be introducing Sef Stephanie Cole, uh, who will then uh, be introducing me. Uh, so Stephanie Cole, who is co-moderating the session today, uh, holds an LLM in European law and works at the European Association of Hospital Pharmacists, EAHP, which represents and develops the hospital pharmacy profession within Europe to ensure the continuous improvement of care and outcomes for patients in the hospital setting. In her role as policy and advocacy uh, officer, she coordinates and supports EAHP's policy engagement on many health um, issues, uh, and policy topics relevant to hospital pharmacists, including but not limited to medicine shortages. Antimicrobial resistance, procurement, digital health, vaccination, and the falsified medicines directive. Before joining EAHP, Stephanie worked for a consultancy that supported the European Commission in examining the implementation of EU legislation, such as the European Cross-Border Healthcare Directive in the different member states. Thank you very much, uh, Stephanie, for agreeing to uh, co-host this e uh, event uh, with me. So over to you. Thank you, Emma, for this kind introduction and also a good afternoon or good morning or good evening to all of you participating from around the world, depending on from where you join us. Um, and before we move on, I have the pleasure to introduce Emma to you. Emma Paulino is a practicing pharmacist at her own community pharmacy in Portugal. She is general manager of ESFI, a company that engages community pharmacies in the implementation of patient support programs. She's president of the Portuguese National Association of Pharmacies, ANF, and was a member of the National Board of the Portuguese Pharmaceutical Society, PPS, until June 2021. Emma represents ANF at various international groups and organizations, such as the Pharmaceutical Group of the European Union, PGU, and the International Pharmaceutical Federation, FIP. Immediate past professional secretary of FIP, and thus a member of its bureau, Emma has previously been chairperson and project coordinator of the Young Pharmacists Group, a member of the FIP program committee, and secretary of the community pharmacy section. Emma is also president of the Pharmaceutical Care Network Europe, PCNA. And now I hand you over again to Emma so that she can walk you through the next slides before we introduce you to our very great speakers of today. Thank you very much, uh, Stephanie, for your kind introduction as well. So a few announcements before uh, we start uh, hearing from our speakers. This webinar is being recorded and live streamed uh, via YouTube. Um, so uh, you will be able to uh, watch the recording afterwards as it will be available on our website at uh, um, the uh, website that you can see on the slide. You may ask questions. We, we kindly ask you to use the question box provided so we uh, uh, would like you to use the chat box to introduce yourself or if you want to make a general comment. But if you would like to uh, ask a specific question to one of the speakers, uh, please use the question box. You are also welcome to provide feedback to uh, any feedback or uh, suggestions you may have. Uh, and of course, you are uh, very much welcome to become a member, uh, an individual member of FIP. Uh, and you can do so by visiting our website and looking at all the, um, uh, all the benefits of becoming a member and how to do it um, uh, with the instructions uh, that are shown uh, on, uh, in the link provided. 
So I will be making a short introduction to uh, the topic that we are going to address today. Uh, so as you might recall, uh, we had a very successful program running in 2020 uh, at the FIP Transforming Vaccination Regionally and Globally program. Uh, and uh, these, are, these are the key uh, outcomes from that program. So this was the first uh, FIP Digital Transformation Outcome-Based Online Program. It was underpinned uh, by the FIP development goals, which you, uh, for, uh, of which you may also uh, learn more if you visit our website. And this resulted in the global FIP commitment to action on vaccination in pharmacies and also the FIP transforming vaccination collection. Uh, all of this can be found uh, on our website. In 2021, uh, we aim to uh, continue to transform vaccination globally, regionally uh, and nationally uh, in uh, a program that uh, consists of 12 events over uh, two series. Uh, and these will be uh, run between June and November. Series one uh, will focus on uh, the topic uh, towards equity in vaccinations globally. And series two, uh, we will be looking at sustainability in vaccinations regionally and nationally. Uh, in the uh, series one towards equity in vaccination globally, uh, the first of the two series uh, actually comprises of five episodes, which include an opening event uh, alongside four other events, events which explore equity in vaccinations across different angles of age, gender, literacy and education and collaboration and working together. In series two, uh, where we will be, uh, or we, we are looking at sustainability in vaccinations regionally and nationally. So uh, this second series comprises seven uh, digital events, including six regional roundtables, which will discuss and identify priorities for sustainable access to vaccinations through pharmacies around the world. This will end with the leadership summit uh, in which we will present a commitment to action. This is actually, this one is the third of uh, the six regions we dissect, uh, and we will focus on the regional needs and driver, drivers for transforming vaccination in the European region. As key outcomes uh, for this Transforming Vaccination 2021, uh, we will have the 12 digital events, which I've already described and the Leadership Summit, which will conclude the series. We will have the FIP Global Commitment to accelerate equity, access and sustainability of vaccinations. And uh, we aim towards having a special policy collection which uh, member organizations can use as well as individual pharmacists to advocate for enhanced um, equity uh, and sustainability of uh, vaccination, of the vaccination effort. Uh, when we are focusing and whilst we are focusing on the European re region, uh, what we would like to um, have as uh, outcomes and what we've already discussed in uh, uh, many of the events that we, uh, we have held uh, in the past as part of these transformation programs, uh, is that we obviously have some regional needs and priorities uh, that uh, have been identified uh, to transform uh, vaccination. And obviously we can learn from lessons uh, from countries where uh, vaccination has already um, uh, been implemented uh, by pharmacists. And we have some um, examples uh, of that in uh, Europe as well. And these uh, experiences can obviously then be used uh, to uh, accelerate this process in other countries. We discussed a lot about the importance of education on vaccination and uh, also uh, the uh, importance of uh, supporting the adoption of new vaccination models. We have identified some challenges experienced uh, in transforming vaccination for pharmacies, like uh, turning pilot programs into sustainable uh, and nationally uh, applicable uh, vaccination services. There are some regulatory obstacles and also receiving the support needed to drive forward changes at national level. And for this, obviously, advocacy is very much needed. Uh, in terms of lessons learned, whilst transforming vaccination for pharmacists, uh, we have learned that pilot projects are actually a great opportunity to showcase the added value, but then we need to expand vaccination uh, 
services so that we can have a, um, a nationwide uh, impact in patient outcomes. Uh, obviously, expanding vaccination services can improve uh, uptake. Key vaccination-related le legislative enablers and barriers that emerged uh, during the discussions um, about uh, the region were le legislative uh, changes that are very much dependent uh, on national factors. Uh, however, this is uh, absolutely uh, relevant uh, within the context of um, implementing uh, these services in pharmacies. Patience and persistence, of, of course, because uh, legislative changes may take some time. Uh, and uh, these have identified as both a barrier and an enabler, uh, obviously. Uh, but for this, uh, advocacy is very much important. And this is what we aim to have uh, in the end of this series, are a collection of um, topics, initiatives, and uh, also uh, good uh, examples that we can show our legislators so that we can have um, le uh, legislation as a, fa a facilitator and not a, a barrier. With this, I turn over back to uh, Stephanie, who will introduce our speakers for today. Thank you very much for your attention. I look forward to uh, your uh, involvement also in the Q&A session at the end of the event. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emma, for providing us with a quick overview about the series in general and what we've already discussed last year during our exchanges uh, for the European region. So um, with this now, we turn our focus to the sustainability sustainable and equitable access to vaccines in the European regions. And our five wonderful speakers will take you through some priorities and policies that they would like to, to set or discuss in relation to the European region. And today we have with us Kuhn Stratmans, the president of the Belgium Pharmaceutical Association, Monica Derek-Poix, the general director of the European Healthcare Distribution Association, GERP, Vibu Paudal, the senior lecturer in clinical pharmacy at the University of Birmingham in the UK Research Committee Chair and member of the European Society of Clinical Pharmacy, Mary Anne Saint Fournier, president of the Malta Chamber of Pharmacists, and Piotr Merks, the president of the Polish Trade Union of Pharmacy Workers the General Secretary of Employed Pharmacists Europe. Our first speaker will now be Kuhn Stratmans. Kuhn Stratmans is the current president of the Belgium Pharmaceutical Association, APB. He was active in APB since March 2007 in several different functions. He's a community pharmacist in the Walloon region of Belgium since 2001. Kuhn has a history of working in community pharmacy, health politics, and community pharmacist advocacy. He is skilled in pharmaceutics, medical devices, management, healthcare politics, regulatory healthcare affairs, people management, and life science. And with that, Kuhn, I hand the floor over to you so that you can share your presentation with us. Hello, everybody, uh, and uh, thank you for joining. I'm joining in from Brussels. Um, as uh, introduction that was quite a bit already just uh, completing that uh, you see a lot of logos on this first slide and we are working together with our regional uh, um, APB is a federation of, of local and regional uh, associations of pharmacists and that is uh, quite a job in in our complicated country to manage the difficulties on the political advocacy with our complex uh, state structure uh, you can go to the next slide so um, just uh, in this in this context, um, giving you some uh, updates and information as my uh, as the former president did last year, uh, Leven, um, uh, on the situation in Belgium uh, on on uh, vaccination uh, mainly on uh, influenza and and COVID, of course. So uh, before 2020 and before the COVID crisis, we were mainly uh, in our Belgian pharmacies occupied in. Uh, distribution and uh, in sensibilization of uh, a lot of uh, vaccines that were that are still and that are distributed in in, uh, in Belgian pharmacies um, and this role of uh, sensibilization and monitoring sensibilization I'll come back to that um, was already uh, quite present but um, with corona 
uh, we will see that uh, things evolved very rapidly um, uh, as it does and did uh, normally in uh, other countries. So we, we, we uh, did already a lot of sensibilization on, uh, on influenza vaccination. Um, and in Belgium, um, only doctors, GPs can, uh, and, and, and nurses can uh, do vaccination. I'll come back to that. And in this context, we see that um, influenza vaccination uh, rate is stabilized, uh, uh, but is even a little bit declining the last, uh, last years before Corona, but is uh, under the threshold of uh, which uh, WHO uh, recommends of uh, 75%. You can go to the next slide. So um, Corona um, hit a turbo button in uh, roles and possible roles uh, of pharmacists in, 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 in vaccination. And I'm mainly talking about uh, Corona and uh, COVID vaccination and, and influenza vaccination. As al already mentioned, our classical roles are the roles of uh, distribution and delivery. Uh, we were already uh, far active in sensibilization in the in the last years, and this was uh, enhanced by Corona. And um, pharmacists uh, became very active and, and, and got out of their community pharmacies uh, in the last months uh, to be also a pre preparator of uh, these vaccines of Corona and COVID vaccines. Uh, which was um, a new role um, in working together in vaccination centers with uh, GPs and nurses. And pharmacists are there to, um, to uh, do what they're good at, uh, assure quality and uh, quality assurance of the, of the preparation of the doses um, in Belgium um, of these uh, vaccines. And um, you will see in the next slide already also that um, we became also prescriber uh, now, um, uh, enhancing uh, our our, um, our trust and, and building our trust and monitoring and uh, and and um, doing advocacy to shorten the patient journey in Belgium for influenza vaccination. I'm talking now. Um, we 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 got it through uh, last season, and this was um, enforced in our in our um, in our Belgian law. Uh, also for the next season, that pharmacists can now uh, prescribe the influenza vaccine. I can mention you that uh, this gave a lot of uh, resistance from certain GP associations, but um, when you mention the, um, the interest of the patient and the patient journey, which uh, before had to go to the doctor for an, uh, a prescription, then to the pharmacy for the vaccine, and then again to the doctor for the vaccination in Belgium, uh, this is a big breakthrough and even a, um, a condition to, to, I think, to become also a vaccinator in, in the future. You can go to the next slide. So uh, another example case, uh, and then I'm uh, uh, talking about uh, also COVID uh, vaccine, vaccines and uh, now uh, starting as from tomorrow, uh, also for the next season of the influenza vaccine, was that um, the governments, while we were already active in sensibilization um, in the last years for uh, influenza, uh, but now the government uh, asked in Belgium uh, to that pharmacy, community pharmacies, uh, took up a role of sensibilization uh, because we see um, as pharmacies, we see a whole lot of more and other people than GPs uh, only see. Um, and took up, we took up the role to, uh, to go into a um, uh, sensibilization talk with patients. Uh, we used, therefore, a technology uh, that we put in, to place last years, and we were able to connect uh, all community pharmacies with uh, respective privacy and GDPR, but um, to connect them with the vaccination status on COVID, uh, which is nationally registered um, in the vaccination centers and all vaccinators. And so we can uh, see in our community pharmacies if someone has already been vaccinated uh, with, a, with, with the corona vaccine or, or not, and uh, uh, start um, a sensibilization talk with the patient, not forcing them, but motivating them to, um, to, to get their COVID vaccine. And this was done through a pop-up uh, in all software with a generic software tool that the Pharmaceutical Association, APB, developed and uh, put into place uh, in all community pharmacies uh, in Belgium. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Building on a trust, you see here, uh, 
um, some screenshots of how this was done. Uh, it was uh, like a pop-up in the in the in the software of pharmacies, and, and earlier we all always have the problem that if we want to move fast and quickly uh, into software development in um, in our country, as I know it it happens also in other countries, we have to give them instructions and wait uh, like six or nine months before uh, some developments are are made. But with the technology we have for of the pharmaceutical uh, dossier uh, in Belgium, we put into place a type of technology as a farm form or an e-form that we developed. And with technology, with these software providers, didn't have to um, develop um, like a generic way. We can put this uh, into place into the software of the of all Belgian pharmacies, and, and a pop up showed up, and uh, questions are asked to the pharmacist, and this uh, this shows how we can um, put into place uh, very rapidly and in a uniform way a service like a, a sensibilization for vaccination, and all all also. Um, get data, mac macro data um, from how the service is being developed in, in the country. And when you do that, you have a, a, a big instrument to uh, in lobbying or in advocacy to uh, convince um, the, the politicians of the, the power of the pharmacy network. Uh, so we know that uh, um, in Belgium we have uh, 11 and a half million uh, people uh, inhabitants and uh, uh, a little bit less than 5 million people were sensibilized with this uh, tool uh, through uh, Belgian community pharmacy um, last weeks and months. You can go to the next slide. So what are our strengths? Um, in Belgium, and I think it's uh, transposable to other countries. Uh, in Belgium, we have um, we have we didn't wait. We 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 wanted to to take uh, uh, to to tackle already some hurdles. And um, last month until summer, we have, we have uh, like two thousand pharmacists uh, that are active in Belgian community pharmacies. But we trained three thousand five hundred of them uh, to be uh, ready for vaccination. Uh, we had them, then the 500 pharmacists engaged in the vaccination centers, uh, not for uh, vaccination, uh, mainly for preparation of the vaccines. I already mentioned that. Um, a weakness maybe uh, in this SWOT analysis can be that um, we still are working at the legal situation uh, hardly uh, to, to get the pharmacist uh, recognized as a vaccinator. Some opportunities, so all the, this, this vaccination campaign was complex. And then uh, when you bring in solutions, uh, pharmacists are good at solutions. Um, this, this is an opportunity. Um, there is a, a shortage of vaccinators in Belgium. So uh, forming them and proposing our, our services in, an, uh, in a positive way for patients and health politics is, is a good thing. We worked at uh, uh, we, we we made work ourselves of um, which laws and which legal things should be adapted to to, to create a legal uh, frame, um, and then uh, we have also the opportunity of much more working together with uh, GPs and nurses uh, on the train. Uh, and some threats, maybe if we are too greedy, we want too too much things at once, we might lose uh, more than we gain. So we we take into account also that uh, reflections are made to uh, uh, put uh, stocks of certain vaccines uh, into the GP's cabinet, like a depot. But we have a lot of arguments uh, saying that this is not a good idea, but we always should take into account certain risks. You can go to the next slide. So um, to give you some things you can do in your country um, and maybe policy game changers or drivers, uh, I mentioned some things here, that, as I already mentioned, uh, uh, mentioned to the politicians and to the all stakeholders in your country, the strengths of the pharmacy, your proximity, your accessibility, the frequency of, our, of your contacts. In Belgium, we see half a million people a day in, in the Belgian community pharmacies. That's, that's a number that we uh, all, always uh, mention. Uh, so, so use the power of these numbers. 
Um, we, we are uh, 11 and a half million people in Belgium and a half million people uh, step into a community pharmacy every day. That's, that, that is a good uh, sh uh, number to, to show off. We are uh, 4,700 pharmacies, 12,000 pharmacists, 6,000 uh, assistants in pharmacies, and we have a very high fidelity rate. So if you have these numbers, use them. Be prepared. Um, as I already mentioned, um, uh, do do the things before uh, you uh, form already your pharmacist, uh, even if you don't even have the legal uh, uh, context or law already in place. So then it's not uh, uh, an obstacle or, or a hurdle anymore, uh, because otherwise they're saying you, know, you don't have the formation to do it. Uh, so now every politician in Belgium knows that we are formed to, to be able to vaccine and create a legal and scientific uh, framework yourself. Uh, ask study opinion uh, material. In Belgium we have, uh, and research data, we have uh, uh, asked a few years past uh, to the uh, Académie Royale de la Médecine en Belgique to form an advice and this advice and also on comparative is, is very, very positive uh, to, to enlarge the vaccination to other vaccinators as uh, pharmacists. And we already did uh, with the French professor uh, Francis Mejerlin, uh, an international comparative study. Uh, and as we, you do today, um, uh, be in contact with other countries, experiences uh, through FIPGU and others uh, that, that gives you all, all also insights. We are running um, a survey, we've run a survey and we picked that up from the French, um, uh, so from, from France, because they did that also to, uh, to uh, enhance in, uh, in, in vaccination by pharmacists. So we did an, uh, a survey here in Belgium uh, recently. Uh, I'm not giving you already all the numbers because uh, it's still not um, published. Uh, we're waiting to, to do that at the right timing uh, to our politicians uh, uh, first and then maybe to global press to uh, to belgian press uh, that is that there is uh, in the survey that we did to to the population and inhabitants of belgium we saw that they're they're very interested in the vaccination uh, by pharmacists uh, inform uh, continue your lobby that's uh, an evidence and uh, make constructive proportions for the existing problems in the field you can go to the next slide uh, yeah, this is one. This one is evident. Uh, work together with the other professionals and, and go to teamwork. Uh, work, work, um, uh, work, work um, uh, with 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 all the the forces in your in your uh, in your community. You can go to the next slide. Taking a, a, into account the timing, all also. Um, so future. Um, this slide i don't want to go to all the details uh, to um, to avoid uh, to, to pass my timing but the best way to predict the future is to create it yourself uh, i think slides will be uh, distributed to everybody uh, but i already mentioned uh, detect the unresolved problems um, make sure you map the needs and uh, use the enablers that you see in this slide to ensure that the new service you are you're proposing is is a, is a necessary and obvious solution for uh, a problem in, in primary care you can go to the next slide so conclusion uh, uh, the attitude of pharmacists uh, to offer solutions i already mentioned that uh, for existing and newly emerging problems uh, on a constructive basis, that is what uh, you should do. I think uh, uh, don't try to force things. Be patient sometimes, all also. But uh, when you're um, advocating the interests of pharmacists, but also the interests of community uh, and 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 health and pub public health, then you can uh, uh, also convince uh, politicians. Uh, conditions are that you have to believe in yourself. Uh, that there is a, a real but unsolved need that is clearly identified, which is the case in Belgium. We have a, a, a low, not enough rate of vaccination on influenza. Uh, COVID is, Belgium is doing very well, but on influenza, where there's a, a lot of uh, progression to make. Um, and uh, at every level, uh, give uh, uh, the same story that and, and, and mention the added value of your new service. Um, so uh, it, sh it should be consistent, your story, and not 
uh, changing uh, and be patient and then you you become results as i mentioned like the prescribing of the pharmacist in belgium for influenza and be prepared um, do the do your homework uh, do your legal homework do your uh, formation of your pharmacist don't wait you, some pharmacists will say well, why do i have to form myself when i don't even can already uh, vaccinate well uh, don't uh, start with that and then uh, the rest will come uh, I hope by itself, I think in Belgium, uh, in 2022, things will change and, and move and we will not only be uh, preparators or sensibilizers or uh, prescribers, but we will become also vaccinators in Belgium. Uh, this was my last slide, I think. Thank you very much, Kuhn, for sharing some insights about the situation in Belgium and also how the future will look like for Belgium community pharmacists uh, next year hopefully. And now we move on to our next speaker, Monica derek Point. She's the Director General of JURP, the European Healthcare Distribution Association, which brings together over 750 pharmaceutical full-line wholesaling companies and their national associations from 34 different countries. Monica was appointed to her current position in 2001, having previously served as European Affairs Consultant for JURP. Monica derek Poir was born in Graz, Austria and holds a master's degree in economics from the University of Economics in Vienna, where she specialized in international trade and marketing. She has over 25 years of experience in European public affairs and healthcare distribution. Prior to her engagement with JERP, she served as a director in a European affairs consultancy company, and she also held a six-year post as marketing and client support manager at IQVIA Austria. Monica, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Stephanie, for this uh, kind introduction. And uh, thank you to you and Emma for having invited me to, to this very important session. So SHIRP is the European Healthcare Distribution Association. Our members are full service healthcare distributors with the backbone of full line wholesaling. They hold uh, on permanence the full range of products um, in order to be a one-stop shop uh, for the pharmacies. Yeah, the healthcare supply chain is now fully engaged in the most important immunization effort in, in living history. And a lot has been communicated about European and international transports of the vaccines, but little is known how they are distributed uh, on the national level, so in the last mile, and I intend to shed a bit of light uh, on this last mile distribution of the vaccines. Um, the SHIRP members have demonstrated their ability to respond effectively to the extraordinary demand of some specific products during the COVID crisis. And now, since the rollout of the vaccines, which has started at the beginning of this year, our sector has proven its ability not only to absorb shocks, but also to come forward with innovative solutions and approaches. And as you can see here on the slide, our sector is involved in COVID vaccines distribution in 17 countries. And in several of these countries, we are also handling 100% of the vaccines, which means they are held in different temperature ranges. Um, the, the Pfizer vaccines, as you certainly know, have to be held in a temperature range of, of around minus 70 degrees. Um, Moderna around uh, minus 20 degrees. And then um, Johnson and Johnson and Astra AstraZeneca are easier to handle and to, to, to store. Um, but they are a bit less in demand currently. If we go to the next slide, please. Yeah, we have tried to um, outline for you here the countries in where COVID vaccines can be dispensed via pharmacies, also in many cases to other healthcare professionals for inoculation, as we have heard uh, from Kuhn before. So these countries are Austria, Estonia, France, Germany, Ireland, Italy, Lithuania, Poland, Switzerland, and the United Kingdom. And then countries 
in which pharmacists can inoculate vaccines. So we have put Belgium in brackets, uh, hopefully that it gets through. And there are, we have heard there are some tests with COVID vaccines in pharmacies. Estonia, Ireland, France, Italy, Lithuania, Norway, Poland, Sweden, Switzerland, and the United Kingdom. So it's a growing number um, of countries. Uh, and we, we are also hopeful for Belgium that this will happen next year. Um, for, at the beginning, it was the big vaccination centers. And then we have seen it gradually moving down to, to the communities and to the pharmacies in order to get uh, closer to the citizens who may be willing to, to get um, a COVID vaccine. If we move to the next slide, please. <coughs> we are here showing you an example on, about the distribution in Austria. So the Austrian association Fago has uh, five full line wholesalers as members, and they uh, manage the whole distribution of COVID vaccines from a central location where they are delivered in, into the country. Then to the vaccines dispensing points, you have there um, on the slide still uh, uh, manufacturers who then, like uh, CureVac, who has uh, announced that they are withdrawing uh, from their clinical trials, and some others who are not on the market yet, but um, the contracts have been in place. And they did deliver to about um, ten, about 1,000 vaccination points and managed to do this in, uh, in a time span of only two hours. They delivered 250 hospitals, 900 care homes, 150 vaccination centers, 1,391 pharmacies, which I think are all pharmacies in Austria, 5,000 doctors and 550 schools and many more to give you an example from one country. And now if we move on, please, I would like to show you how this is done in practice. Um, yeah, as I said, little has been published and uh, we wanted to highlight how the vaccines distribution is done in practice with a very short video, which hopefully is going to play. In several European countries, pharmaceutical full-line wholesalers ensure the safe and efficient distribution of vaccines to healthcare professionals. In Germany and France, for example, Phoenix supplies pharmacies with the vaccine and vaccination material to support national immunization campaigns. Supply to pharmacies is in full swing in France and Germany. High-quality, efficient logistics is key. The BioNTech vaccine in particular is challenging. It is delivered to us ultra-cooled at minus 70 degrees. When we take it out of this environment to single out vials for further distribution, the clock starts ticking. The vaccine is then stored at 2 to 8 degrees and must be administered to patients within the following five days. The vaccine from AstraZeneca must also be permanently refrigerated, but it does not require ultra-cooling. One of the new processes is singling out the vials. The employees are very careful with the precious goods. In addition, the vaccination materials are an integral part of every COVID-19 vaccine delivery to the pharmacies. The pharmacies prepare the final packaging for the doctors. In addition, distribution to pharmacies in Germany and France must follow a strict allocation key set by the health authorities given the initial limited quantities available. The vaccine distribution process is complex and had to be implemented quickly. Therefore, following the order preparation, the boxes with the vials are delivered directly to the pharmacies and passed on to the doctors that same day. So yeah, I think it, it gave you a quick uh, impression. The, the big trouble was at the beginning to single out the vials and to deliver the right needles uh, with the vaccines uh, to the points where they were needed. But uh, luckily we, we managed that quite efficiently. The next slide, this slide shows you the dual distribution. As you all know, we are uh, talking about the twin demic, so we don't know about uh, the rates of 
of influenza um, and how quickly it, it will spread, but uh, campaigns are already on its way. And um, we will need to, to, to prepare for a double uh, inoculation, influenza vaccines as well as COVID vaccines. And um, this slide shows you uh, the countries in which pharmacies can vaccinate both. And uh, now to point out Estonia, France, Ireland, Norway, Switzerland and the UK, in, in these countries, the pharmacists can inoculate both uh, flu vaccines as well as COVID vaccines. If we move on, please. Yeah, for us, this dual distribution is, of course, a challenge um, because it's the booster shots at the same time as the flu vaccines. They, they all require cold room storage capacity or then as, as outlined before in the video, um, ultra cold temperatures you see uh, on the picture on the right part, but to the left, um, an old ultra cold fridge or freezer, and then the freezer for the Moderna vaccines, which is then um, a very different model again. And otherwise it uh, requires big uh, capacities in cold room storage. And we, our sector can do it, but what we have been asking um, to the manufacturers of the vaccines is that it, it is very important for us to have a transparency and an overview to know which vaccines are going to be delivered to us at what point of time in order to ensure that the cold room storage capacity is there and the vaccines are delivered in the right quality uh, when they are needed. And if we move to the next slide which is already our last slide. Here we wanted to, to just say that we have um, made a declaration to get together with Vaccines Europe um, as a multi-stakeholder approach. And we would like to see the maximization of pharmacies as a key resource for accessible and convenient administration of both COVID and flu vaccines. And uh, the pharmacies is really best placed, uh, the most accessible um, uh, point uh, where, where patients can not only get information and being sensibilized um, about uh, the importance to get vaccinated, but also ideally to be the point where, where they can get inoculated at the same time. Yeah, we believe that a stakeholder collaboration is key um, our sector, but then together with the other healthcare value chain stakeholders. And finally, a clear communication on to the healthcare professionals to give them guidance and to manage the vaccination of influenza alongside with the COVID-19 one. That's our current challenge uh, for this autumn and winter and yeah, we are very confident that if we join forces, we, we make the best efforts um, to get a high rate of not only COVID vaccines, but also citizens uh, vaccinated against the flu. Thank you. That was in a nutshell what I wanted to convey. Great. Thank you so much, Monica, for sharing with us how in practice the distribution of vaccines work from the wholesale perspective and also providing us with some insights on the challenges that actually the dual distribution of a COVID and flu vaccine poses. So now we move on to our third speaker of today, which is Dr. Vibhu Paudal. He's a senior lecturer of clinical pharmacy at the University of Birmingham. And he's also currently the chair of the European Society of Clinical Pharmacy. Dr. Powder has special interest in public health aspects of pharmacy practice. He has delivered external funded projects and published extensively around health disparity and access to healthcare with a particular focus on vulnerable populations. During the COVID-19 pandemic, he has been leading research work around the impact of the pandemic on patient access to pharmacy and health service. Since the rollout of the COVID-19 vaccination, he has researched pharmacist and pharmacy staff involvement in the vaccination process. So with much further ado, Vibo, the floor is yours. Thank you, Stefani. And um, I would like to welcome you all and thank you all for joining, giving me this opportunity, the organizers. 
Um, as Stefani already introduced uh, me, I work here in the University of Birmingham in England. So I'm joining from the office this uh, afternoon here. And I also chair the research committee at ESCP. So hopefully the, um, my colleagues, uh, organizer colleagues will excuse me for also asking to join uh, ESCP as well as FIP. So um, next slide, please. So today uh, my presentation is going to be focused on, I think, you know, it makes my job a lot easier because some of my, um, some of my European colleagues have already mentioned what's happening with COVID-19 vaccine um, uh, programs in relation to pharmacy involvement in Europe. So I will probably um, um, provide a bit more detail on the current practice policies and learnings from what's happening. Next slide, please. So uh, this is a bit obvious. We uh, saw um, interesting science um, in regards to the distribution from Monica's uh, excellent presentation earlier. Um, but the challenge we have is to um, vaccinate as many uh, in the population in a shorter time time frame. And to an extent, we've already achieved that in the in the past few months to certain vulnerable populations. But still, we are now progressing towards vaccinating the younger ones in Europe and for the rest of the um, world, um, it may not be um, in, in such positions. We are still uh, looking at you know, 10, 15, 20, 25% of adults uh, having access to vaccination. So there's a lot to actually do globally in order to get this um, uh, equitable distribution access. Um, so next slide, please. So when this uh, COVID-19 pandemic hit us, uh, we were um, quite busy researching how pharmacists have been uh, actually involved in dealing with the pandemic, mitigating the impact of the pandemic, providing care to the patients. So this was a, a pan-European studies. We um, uh, did uh, interview pharmacists from 16 European countries uh, and a range of roles that they had actually undertaken um, um, in the face of the pandemic, such as direct clinical care of COVID-19 patients in ICU. Um, they were at the for forefront of facilitation of clinical trials. Um, doctors, nurses, and other healthcare professionals, patients would come and ask them uh, about the recent um, uh, evidence in regards to uh, the, the effectiveness of medicines, as well as the uh, development having, having uh, in regards to vaccine development. And in the community, they, uh, they did some uh, great examples in regards to providing educations, dismissing myths, and still happening in regards to uh, uh, anti-vaccine myths as well. And, and when, uh, at that time, the vaccines weren't available, so they had um, expressed readiness to be involved in the vaccination process once they were developed and approved. And now we're in this situation. So I would like to um, discuss in the next slides. Uh, where are we in regards to that last bullet point? So this is a systematic review that was published prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. So this wasn't in the face of the pandemic. So there's no bias here. So this systematic review, um, which was about how far the uh, pharmacist uh, or pharmacy involvement in, in vaccination programs um, do help um, um, improve um, uh, the rate of vaccinations in the community and also whether they're accepted by patients uh, and the stakeholders. So this systematic review has cited six studies which shows that when pharmacies do get involved in the vaccination process, the rate of vaccination in the community goes up. So we have a, a, a very strong evidence from um, multiple studies that getting pharmacies involved in direct vaccination, direct inoculation. I'm not just talking about the distribution here. Uh, for pharmacist staff to actually inoculate the patients, uh, the rate of vaccinations in the community does increase. Um, and there are many factors to it because uh, they're accessible. There's uh, uh, often no need for appointments. And there's uh, a space where actually patients can um, uh, ask more information about uh, some of the myths they may have heard or effectiveness safety, which your pharmacy staff are often willing to provide um, without even appointment. So, um, however, despite this evidence, we have political and organizational barriers that prevent pharmacists participation in vaccination programs. Next slide, please. So, um, um, earlier this year, we undertook a sort of a policy analysis of 
what's happening in, in um, the, some of the European countries in regards to both policy and practice uh, uh, around pharmacist involvement in COVID-19 vaccination. Um, we reviewed um, through the help of our colleagues, legal framework, services specifications, trade reports uh, uh, were needed. So we unfortunately couldn't involve all the European countries, but we had 13 countries participating here. Um, and some of the countries mentioned in the earlier slides, unfortunately, aren't covered. Uh, but we managed to take a snapshot of what is happening uh, within these countries. And the info that I'm presenting today uh, is accurate as of June 2021, which means we have progressed a few months, which means some of the countries that I'm going to uh, mention here uh, have made some uh, important progresses in regards to uh, getting pharmacy staff involved in, in the vaccination process. So next slide, please. So uh, when we looked at you know, how pharmacies are, were doing, so, so the countries such as Switzerland, UK and Ireland, and Italy was also in the pilot phase at that time. So, uh, and Switzerland is mostly a canton based or a specific geography who have more power about uh, how uh, pharmacy uh, can be involved. But these were the three countries that uh, at that point um, who had allowed direct administration of vaccines to the patients. And uh, the rest of the other 10, um, and I mean, most of the situations, the uh, participation was limited to vaccines, logistics, supply, preparations, um, as well as patient education and counseling, where uh, pharmacy space uh, were offered they were, um, uh, there was a requirement that uh, an authorized uh, healthcare professional, which uh, would be other than the pharmacist, for example, the doctors or nurses would come to inoculate patients in pharmacies. So out of the 13, so we had three um, countries at that point would uh, allowed fully the vaccination, uh, inoculation, direct inoculation to the patients. Next slide, please. Um, so um, I would describe a bit more about how pharmacists are involved in, in the UK, uh, for example. So one of the countries of the three that we saw the practices were already happening. Uh, so in the UK, uh, the pharmacists uh, or pharmacies can actually host, host a vaccination site within the community pharmacy, or they can join, um, um, uh, provide vaccination in another site, for example, if the space is unsuitable. They can also hire a community center uh, or they can partner with other um, organizations or primary care networks, for example, the GP practices uh, and, and join them in, in the vaccination exercise. Um, so uh, to do this, the pharmacies can enter a direct contracting arrangement with the NHS England, which is the main healthcare provider in the, in the UK, in, in England. And, um, or they can also enter a subcontracting arrangement, which means uh, with a GP practice or a primary care network, uh, that's when uh, they can uh, offer the vaccination. So they have direct and indirect route to offering vaccination. They get remunerated um, a fixed fee for vaccination um, and uh, administered to the patients. And it's not just pharmacists, uh, it's also the technicians who can um, uh, inoculate the patients. So uh, uh, there's a step uh, ahead here. Uh, they have to do uh, an online course before they can actually inoculate the patients. And in the UK, uh, there's also um, any members of public uh, after a training event can also um, inoculate patients, but um, it's uh, mainly the healthcare students um, who um, are involved in, in such a process, but in pharmacy, this could be pharmacy support staff as well. But most of the times it will be pharmacists and technicians uh, who are inoculating the patients. Slide, please. So um, an example here. So if we have uh, Dutch colleagues, so hopefully they will excuse me for picking Netherlands, but um, I think we're tr trying to uh, see here how we can um, improve uh, you know, vaccination practices by involving uh, more and more of the pharmacy staff and pharmacists. But this is one example of uh, the regulatory hurdles we have uh, to overcome. So uh, here in Netherlands, uh, Dutch pharmacists are not uh, legally allowed to administer vaccines directly uh, to a patient. 
So it's a reserved act according to the Dutch law, which is the law is about professions in individual healthcare. So under this law, only the doctors, advanced nurses and physician assistants are considered independently competent to administer vaccine by injection, which means the pharmacists aren't listed there. And uh, despite pharmacy, you know, the vaccines being um, uh, provisioned in GPs, care homes, municipal health services and pharmacies are not very far from these centers. Uh, so far, um, um, up to the point when we collected the data, the pharmacists weren't involved. Next slide, please. So um, here, um, so in some countries, for example, Italy, uh, the progress was uh, being made. Uh, so in April, there was a, a campaign and the health minister signed a protocol to allow pharmacists qualified by specific central training uh, to administer COVID-19 vaccines. And from June 21, um, that's now beginning to happen. So hopefully we're seeing more and more pharmacies in Italy making that progress. So um, at that point, we had um, some countries already doing it, some not doing it, but some were in the process of doing it. And we want to see more and more countries joining this vaccination drive, uh, because as we uh, seen earlier, uh, in the published literature, it actually helps uh, improve vaccination rates in the community. Next slide, please. So this is a summary. Uh, so where the um, pilots were happening in Germany, Italy, but we had Ireland, Switzerland, and the UK, where pharmacists in independently were administering the vaccines. So it's usually um, the phase physicians or nurses under the responsibility of a physician actually um, inoculate patients. Now, um, I'm sure this exercise can be um, repeated in the rest of the, the Europe, uh, as well as in other countries. And I know there's some great seminars coming um, in other regions. So uh, it would be really good to uh, partner with some of the colleagues in the audience. So if there was an uh, exercise, something like this possible, so that we can bring that policy forum uh, to debate what can we do uh, to improve uh, policy and practices in countries where pharmacists are yet to get that uh, inoculation rights. Next slide, please. So this is um, again, uh, says telling the same story. So this is where have the vaccinations been offered in different countries. So here's hospitals, nursing homes, primary healthcare centers, you know, so football stadiums, fair trade centers, uh, patients on homes and community pharmacies. So we want to get more and more of the community pharmacies being listed as vaccination sites in the future. Next slide, please. So the question about how can we improve access equity and sustainability? Uh, so the answer from uh, based on my presentation is, uh, we need to have greater involvement of community pharmacy um, staff uh, pharmacists and support staff in the actual vaccination process. Um, um, and we need to overcome the legislative and bureaucratic barriers that are preventing pharmacists to administer vaccines. And we have uh, you know, plenty of evidence. So we saw from um, previous presentations this afternoon that uh, we talked about pharmacists prescribing. So let's say in the UK, pharmacists are already prescribing um, any uh, licensed medicines under their area of competence. So um, there's a lot of evidence to come from uh, flu vaccines as well. So pharmacist independent prescribing, um, um, other medication review programs where it allows pharmacists to change the prescriptions. Uh, so there's a lot of evidence to be gathered if we need to make a force to, um, uh, to take this to the policy level to, make to ensure that in the future pharmacists do get um, the, um, the training, the necessary um, uh, policy, uh, um, uh, the, the permissions to, to uh, inoculate farm patients in their pharmacy. And also, uh, so far, we've not um, had any evidence to suggest that administering vaccines in community pharmacy premises pose increased safety risks or makes vaccine any ineffective. So uh, there's a lot of evidence to be gathered here in making sure that we can involve pharmacies even better in the future. Next slide, please. Okay, so nearly the last slide. So research and practice. So we need to get stakeholder consensus to allow policy changes 
share good practice and evidence from other countries where pharmacists with similar trainings are uh, in, inoculating patients. Uh, patient experiences of vaccination through pharmacy, we've heard anecdotally that they are great, but we need to provide a robust evidence that this actually um, is true in, in terms of uh, how patients perceive community pharmacy uh, services in vaccinations and ensure that pharmacies, when they spend time in uh, providing vaccinations, um, educating the public, they take time out from their routine dispensing or any other business that would uh, make uh, the pharmacies uh, money. We need to ensure that that remuneration is provided. And we also um, need to ensure that we promote the suitability of pharmacy premises for vaccinations. Next slide, please. Okay, so I would like to thank the European Society of Clinical Pharmacy, all the experts and co-authors. So our paper uh, is in the European uh, International Journal of Clinical Pharmacy, open access. So please do uh, read, uh, download and read the full paper and uh, you're welcome to uh, subscribe to the IJCP. So I'm also one of the associate editors of the journal. Um, and uh, we look forward to having seen more countries in the future, uh, allowing pharmacists to be involved. Uh, and the last slide. So there's some related COVID-19 uh, work, um, if you're interested. So if uh, hopefully this uh, video is going to be available, but most of them are open access and you're welcome to uh, contact me for any collaborative opportunities. Thank you, Stefan. Okay, thank you so much, Vipu, for providing us with some insights on the current practice policies and learnings when it comes to pharmacist involvement in COVID-19 vaccination. And with that, we move on to our fourth speaker, Marianne saint fonnier She's the president of the Malta Chamber of Pharmacists, the national association representing pharmacists wherever they practice. And she's also one of the first Commonwealth Pharmaceutical Association Fellowship awardees which she received in 2017 in recognition of her service to pharmacy in the Commonwealth. In her career in pharmacy spanning for more than 40 decades, Mary Ann, a B-Pharm and the first MPhil graduate in pharmacy from the University of Malta Faculty of Medicines and Surgery, has a varied portfolio of experience in academic teaching, focusing on pharmaceutical and medicinal chemistry, drug abuse and prevention, and professional ethics, research linked to, for example, molecular pharmacology, medicinal chemistry, pharmacogenomics in TDM, drug usage in particular, physiotropic drugs, pharmacy practice research, and ethics. And she has also long-standing professional practice experience in pharmaceutical marketing and community pharmacy. Mary Ann leads all delegations for negotiations with government on all matters concerning pharmacists, pharmacies, medicines, and healthcare, including pharmaceutical legislation, policy, and reform. Under her leadership, the Chamber achieved landmark agreements with the government on the professional recognition and career progression of pharmacists and government services, the decentralization of the distribution of national health service medicines through the pharmacy of the patient's choice, which enables equitable access of chronic entitled patients to their pharmacists' professional services and their NHS medicine in the community. Since the introduction of the POYC, together with her team, she has striven to develop the system to meet patients' needs and empower pharmacists to develop their professional competencies and services supported by the professional digital tools. One of the Chamber's flagship projects is the life course vaccination by pharmacists is advocated for by the FIP global objective of transforming vaccination. The floor is yours, Marianne. Thank you. That was a very nice presentation. Thank you, Stephanie. It is my pleasure to be here today and to give an update um, since my participation in the um, uh, event that was held in December, the regional event, um, with regards to where we're going um, in vaccination in Malta. Next slide, please. 
So um, my remit today is exactly what I just said, that um, I was asked to present these changes that have happened, and there have been quite a transformation, I would say, uh, since December 2020, as well as the needs and drivers that can move um, this transformation forward. Next slide, please. The present FIP digital event addresses transforming vaccination globally, regionally, and nationally and accelerating equity, access, and sustainability through policy development and implementation. Um, uh, as I said, at the FIP regional event, which was held on the 1st December 9, uh, 2020, we addressed the needs and drivers for vaccination transformation in Europe. And so today's participation focuses on sustainable and equitable access to vaccines and establishing the priorities and setting policies in the European region with examples from Malta. Next slide, please. Okay, so this um, uh, diagram uh, presents um, uh, the position as it was, for example, in uh, March 2020, we had the first registered COVID-19 uh, case, unfortunately, in Malta. To date, we have um, uh, 37,149 confirmed cases with 457 deaths, regrettably. Um, uh, this data is taken uh, as at um, the end of September uh, or the 1st October of this year. So there, there may be some um, changes there. With regards to the number of vaccine doses, we have eight, uh, more than 800,000 vaccine doses delivered. And this means that a large proportion of the adult population and now uh, over 12 year olds are vaccinated many with the second doses. The Malta Chamber lobbied and collaborated with the health authorities to ensure that all pharmacists were fully vaccinated against COVID-19. Um, uh, in fact, pharmacists were in the first cohort of um, uh, healthcare workers, frontliners, etc. But of course, it, it took you know the chamber as collaboration to ensure that pharmacists, and especially in particular community pharmacists, because they were on the front line even during the um, partial lockdowns, um, uh, because of course they were um, required to remain open and give a service, and which they did, um, uh, quoting the Minister for Health brilliantly. Um, uh, and we ensured that, of course, they were um, fully vaccinated together, especially to come to pharmacies, together with the staff, because we considered them as, uh, you know, to be in their bubble, you know, in the cluster. So we ensured that. And um, uh, by uh, March, most pharmacists were most, most pharmacists were vaccinated and then fully with staff, let's say, by the first half of 2021 of this year. The chamber is now lobbying for the third dose. In fact, um, uh, when I wrote this, uh, these slides, the third dose had not yet been um, uh, uh, presented, uh, uh, sorry, uh, confirmed by the, by the government, but now um, the third dose has been confirmed. The over 85s and people in care homes have been vaccinated and um, uh, the over 70s are now being called up whilst um, uh, the uh, Minister for Health has, has uh, confirmed with the Chamber that pharmacists are included in the healthcare workers uh, cohort, which will be receiving the booster dose. Um, uh, in parallel with the work being carried out with vaccination in the first six months of this year, uh, the Multas KVTF, which is the camera, cameras, the Maltese name for chamber. So the cameras vaccination task force intensified its work to ensure the upskilling and updating of pharmacists in readiness for their role as life course vaccinators. Inspired, of course, by the work of the FIP in transforming vaccination, um, PGEU and CPA and our uh, fellow associations in Europe. The, um, uh, what we did was that we worked on a very robust and comprehensive academic and professional online CP program. This was entitled Pharmacist Led Life Course Vaccination and ran from the 2nd to the 30th of September in 2021. So just a couple of weeks ago, it came to an end. Um, uh, in the same way, in parallel, we organized um, a hands-on um, BLS, uh, basic life support, and AED and vaccination competency course, which will uh, be uh, start, will kick off on Saturday, in fact, and will go on 
over to the 30th October. And now we have more and more registrants. We have more than 100 registrants. And for Malta, being a small country, don't forget that we, we have 222, 220 pharmacies, about that much. And so um, this will cover the whole community pharmacy network. But we also have requests. And this uh, course will spill over into uh, November. Next slide, please. So um, uh, this is what uh, has been happening uh, in parallel to the COVID vaccination. The chamber had focused on the evolving role of pharmacists in the immunization in community. And this goes to even longer than the trials that I mentioned here. We have a longstanding experience of working in the field. So we have researched and there was a lot of groundwork, especially in the past three years. We researched, monitored, discussed, participated in national and international conferences. In our opinion, a landmark conference was the, that one organized by ICA in Venice in 2018. Um, ICA is the European um, uh, interprofessional um, organization on, on the aging, where there was a very big spearheading of the role of pharmacists in, um, uh, in pharmacist vaccination and workshops on the subject. Of course, we followed very diligently the digital events of FIP um, in transforming vaccination. And as you see nationally, um, over the previous five years from 2018, the chamber held workshops, seminars, updates on vaccinology, vaccination policy, promoting and supporting pharmacists' roles. These were held in conjunction with um, medical uh, leaders, pharmaceutical leaders, and pharmaceutical industry. Um, we have worked and continue to work very closely with the Advisory Committee on Immunization Policy, the ACIP, uh, for example, eminent, um, uh, the chair, for example, and other members of this committee were speakers in our September CPD program, and with medical and pharmaceutical colleagues in clinical practice and from the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so um, this hierarchical diagram shows the um, uh, organization, if you wish, of the uh, CPD program. Um, they were two hour long uh, webinars. There were seven webinars in all, including chats and Q&As. Um, uh, there were more than 280 registrants. These were pharmacists, senior pharmacy students from the MFARM course. Um, uh, uh, there were local and uh, even international students who are following their studies locally, um, and also pharmacists who have recently uh, graduated. Um, uh, these were enrolled into our, into our course. And uh, from the statistics that we saw, the whole community pharmacy network was covered. The, um, uh, there were 30 eminent multidisciplinary national international speakers. Um, I must say that there was a strong FIP presence because we had the uh, Dominique Jordan uh, president, we had um, Catherine Duggan who made a very interesting presentation on, on the um, developmental goals with regards to as foundations to the transforming vaccination and in the final session we're very happy to have our colleague um, uh, Gonzalo Souza Pinto, so it's quite a strong um, uh, FIP presence. International pharmacists and umbrella organizations, of course, there was also PGEU and CPA, um, policy makers, pharmacists, clinicians, scientists, and the pharmaceutical industry. With regards to the competencies for, of this um, emanated from this um, uh, CPD program, uh, there was empowerment, enabling, it was uh, updating and upskilling, and also advocacy and mentoring by peers. Prevention and management of communicable and non-communicable disease through vaccination in children, adolescents, adults, and elderly. And we also looked and discussed in depth on how this the vaccination, for example, from childhood affects um, uh, quality of life and health in elderly, in adults and the elderly, and also um, uh, you know, the, the, the um, uh, uh, morbidity and mortality in these age groups. The state of the art immunology, vaccinology, vaccine development, safety to regulation, and pharmacovigilance. There was a very um, interesting um, emphasis, which I will talk about later, on the pharmacovigilant role of pharmacists, especially with the use of COVID 19 vaccines and in people who had COVID and long COVID. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So, um, uh, as I mentioned, we were also working on the organization 
you know, an accredited online and hands-on basic life support and automa automatic external defibrillator course and vaccination competency course, which kicks off on the 16th October, which is next Saturday. At the moment, we are just tying up the loose ends, I must say. Um, uh, at the time of writing this, um, uh, this PowerPoint presentation, there were 93 registrants. These have now spilled over, there are quite a number. And as I said, we have extended the timetable to the end of November. Um, it will be accredited, it is accredited and will be certified by the European Resuscitation Council. Um, the course is organized in collaboration with the Malta Resuscitation Council, but certification will be by the ERC. Um, and the vaccine competency um, is being delivered by the Association of Emergency Medicine Doctors, the, the physicians in Malta. And um, this is very interesting because I must say that since the last time that I presented, I was um, talking about the challenges and the barriers that, that um, uh, we, we were meeting with regards to our medical colleagues, for example. But um, since then, I can report, and I think the next the subject of the next slide is this, um, that uh, what first were challenges now have become drivers. Um, pharmacist vaccinators in the national scheme of things um, was the title of the last session of the webinar. And this was dedicated to discussing with policymakers and uh, with, with the task force on uh, the way forward, basically. So um, we were very pleased to hear, and we know this, of course, we've reported it even elsewhere, that historically pharmacists in Malta have administered various medicines by injection. Um, uh, and it was uh, suggested that perhaps we do not need to consider legislation as a, as a hurdle, but we have to discuss that, of course, with policymakers. But I mean, these were policymakers who are making these statements. The Malta Chamber is implementing a professional structured program to update upskilled pharmacists in a framework that assures safety to patients, acceding to community pharmacy vaccination services, certified and accredited professional and academic and hands-on courses, as I said. We, we are advocating two scenarios, an NHS model and a private practice model, both of which, of course, should be remunerated, as my um, previous colleagues have stated. And um, uh, initially, we are advised and we consider it to be correct to target adults and the elderly. Um, uh, we have also uh, provided or pro uh, presented at this last session a protocol regulated service. Um, this protocol is still being uh, drafted, but um, uh, we have a lot of research background to it and the uh, support of uh, our fellow um, uh, European organizations such as the um, IPU, um, the, the, the Irish Pharmacists Union, and the MPA, whom I thank uh, very much. Pharmacists are thus in a position to give a holistic and um, uh, pharmaceutical care service by full communicable disease management. And we would like to go and look at it from a holistic point of view, not just as a sort of pigeonholing it into vaccination. We consider vaccination as uh, promoting good holistic pharmaceutical care service. Um, sourcing, dispensing, you give factual advice and correct information. We, we um, dispel or attempt, of course, to dispel vaccine hesitancy based on fact, enabling increased access and uptake of vaccines in the community. Next slide, please. Um, so as I said, uh, we look at needs and drivers. Um, don't forget that my, the title of my presentation is uh, Life Course Led Co Life, uh, Pharmacist Led Life Course Vaccination in Malta Onwards and Upwards, using the terminologies um, that have been used previously in uh, Foresight uh, methodology. So the needs and drivers would be uh, needs initiating vaccination by pharmacists to prevent communicable disease. We believe that that is a need and increase the uptake of vaccines, flu, uh, the PCV-13, shingles and COVID-19 third dose. Um, the excess out of hours of health centers, clinics and hubs. I think that this has already been mentioned previously by uh, my colleagues here, but um, I'm also quoting here our colleagues who's up into 
who emphasized this at our seventh session. Pharmacovigilance by pharmacists. I've already mentioned this. Um, uh, the uh, CEO of the Malta Medicines Authority, who was um, who made a presentation and participated in the discussion at the seventh seminar, stated that the most robust reports were received by pharmacists during the COVID-19 pandemic. In his words, he said that pharmacists saved lives. And so this shows to us the importance also of the pharmacovigilant role in COVID-19 and the true vaccination and also in general. Pharmacist management of vaccine adverse events, for example, anaphylaxis, this is part of the training and is also very important. And of course, that the remunerated pharmacist service model in community pharmacy is also very important. Drivers, well, um, uh, since the 1st of December, when I made my presentation, I can report that we have identified several champions in the medical field, in policy making level, and also at political level, because I mean, we have a very strong support from the opposition, and we're looking also for more support from the government of the day. We are nearing election time, in fact. Evolvement of pharmacist roles as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, uh, we all, like our um, colleagues um, in other countries and member states, um, have developed pharmacist services. They have been very innovative, very, um, they proved their competency. Um, uh, for example, we are very um, uh, jealous of the fact, and we want to keep it, it's a feather in our cap, the fact that we um, have done away with prescriptions, especially within the NHS, within the pharmacist of the patient's chose model, which was um, uh, mentioned by Stephanie in her introduction. Um, uh, there we have done away with the prescription, but um, only at the pharmacist's discretion um, if they feel that a patient should be referred for change of dose or change of um, treatment, et cetera, or for need of a review. Um, uh, also uh, with psychiatric preparations at the instigation and support of the lead um, uh, psychiatrists. Uh, this is a bit um, harder in private practice, but it's also been implemented. Um, and so that is something that we are proud of and we think and believe, and from what we discussed at this last seminar, um, uh, legislation should not be a hurdle and also the requirement for a prescription, which could be a barrier to access to vaccination, in fact. Um, uh, pharmacists are innovative and creative, um, uh, and there is a high competency level. Next slide, please. So, um, uh, in the words of uh, my dear colleague, uh, Gonzalo, um, as he stated that um, pharmacists as vaccinators in Malta are but a stone throw away, and I say onwards and upwards. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marianne, for sharing the insights about the pharmacy practice in Malta. And now, last but very not least, we move on to our fifth presenter, Dr. Piotr Merckx. He's a licensed pharmacist, adjunct professor at the Faculty of Medicine Collegium Medicum Cardinal Stefan Wisniewski University in Warsaw, Poland, CEO of PicDirect Limited Company funded by the National Center of Research Development in Poland and Black Pearls VC. He holds international expertise in various pharmacy sectors, including educational facilities, governmental and non-governmental bodies, pharmaceutical companies, hospitals, and community pharmacies. As an educator and innovator, Piotr works to empower pharmaceutical scientists and pharmacists as the future leaders in healthcare. He started his career as a registered pharmacist in the UK primary care setting, delivering public health interventions to patients in underserved communities across the UK. It was his early experience and practice that inspired him to conduct research in social pharmacy before moving into the academic sector full-time in 2011. He went on to earn his PhD in pharmaceutical care services and achieved his degree in 2017. Piotr launched the Polish pharmacy trade union ZZPF to support employees in, in the pharmacy sector. He is a recognized leader across the pharmacy profession and more widely in science, pharmaceutical technology and innovation. He's also working closely with FIP on the development of pharmaceutical pictograms and Polish pharmacy sector as an advisor. His work, research and leadership 
have been recognized internationally. Throughout his career, Piotr has acted as a passionate advocate for the pharmacy profession and has partnered with stakeholders across sectors to align the pharmacy workforce with the sustainable development goals to make an embracing change for the pharmacy as a profession. Piotr, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much for the invitation to FIP and also to our sponsors. Um, uh, so I would like to just uh, tell you exactly how we've done it in Poland, because I think it's very interesting. Uh, if I could just ask for the next slide, thank you very much. So the, the situation in Poland, uh, uh, if you could just move to the next slide, I will show a few, few diagrams, please. Uh, so uh, currently the, the, the main motivator was the, the, the flu vaccination rates in Poland. As you can see, uh, it's extremely bad because we shifted from three 0.66% to current situation is around well, slightly over six. And uh, it was just shifted during the COVID-19 pandemic when actually there was lots of campaigns that it's worth actually to have this both uh, uh, vaccinations together. Next slide, please. Um, another problem that we have basically is the, is the limited number of healthcare workers. It includes obviously doctors, nurses, and also a pharmacist. As, as you can see, as, as the data from the OECD, uh, Poland is on the last place. So it means we need to basically, we are desperate to use any kind of resources. Obviously pharmacies are the most important uh, now to be used and, and, and uh, take advantage of um, uh, to provide basically uh, services. During the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, uh, to just summarize uh, in my research, only 11% of GP practices were open to deliver the standard services. The rest were tackled, basically 90% of people were tackled by the community pharmacist. Uh, uh, seeing in the first period of pandemic, I uh, just would like to kindly remind that Poland is 38 million people. So we're tackling around 8 million a day at the total, uh, at the total of uh, nearly 13,000 pharmacists in, in, in Poland. Uh, so it's a, it's a great amount. Uh, average per day, it's around 2 million of people we are seeing every day. So it's a, a great potential, but unfortunately uh, still not used properly. Next slide, please. Uh, what, 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 what is about the market? Because I'll just make a, a short summary. So the population is around 30, 38, 39 million. Uh, we have around 16 million patients at risk of flu. And, and uh, we have basically a strong recommendation from the Ministry of Health and, and, and the government. But unfortunately, we have, we have low, low, very low activation of the healthcare workers to provide the vaccines. Uh, till uh, basically uh, the bill, uh, in 2019, basically 99% uh, uh, basically of, uh, they were expended from the, from the private budget. So it means that patients were, were paying themselves. Uh, in 2018, it was a slightly shift in the in the trend. So 50% um, basically, uh, it was reimbursed to the uh, group of people over 65. And in 2020, we observe a, a big move because uh, we have basically divided different sectors and uh, uh, two to five years old children and adults, basically they have 50% reimbursement and all the citizens over 75, they are 100% reimbursed for the for the vaccine for for the flu, and um, uh, and obviously a few main players. Uh, we have Sanofi Pasteur that is 67% uh, on the market, Milan, and uh, since uh, 2020 also AstraZeneca. Uh, the, about rates and vac va vaccination rates. So influenza obviously was the first concept uh, to 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 be presented to to do vaccines in in, in Poland. Um, uh, but not, not yet in the pharmacies. We are still waiting for this legislation, but I would just make a sum up, sum up in, the evening, in, in, the, in, the, in the end of the presentation. So uh, we have 13% of elderly people over 65, but only 4% of them are vaccinated. So, so uh, I believe this is, this, is, this is really bad. As I said, COVID-19 slightly make aware people and especially old seniors, citizens uh, about uh, necessity of, of, uh, of um, um, influenza vaccines, also about uh, pneumonia, uh, pneumococcal vaccines, uh, but it's still that, the, the, I mean, the immunization rate is really low, what we are not very happy with. Uh, and obviously we have permanent shortages at the doctors and nurses, uh, but also pharmacists. So we were thinking that maybe a small, a small um, involving pharmacists in vaccines could make a, a, a small difference uh, to help basically um, uh, deliver uh, this uh, prophylactic um, uh, services. And obviously another problem that we have is, is, is the, the, the competences of physicians and, and uh, uh, that there's lots of needs to be done basically to activate them to, uh, to, to provide the service. And it's not very popular and they don't get much benefit from it. So obviously nobody's really properly motivating um, uh, the, the vaccination services. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, I'll just show you the way what we've done. So basically all, all, the, all the projects started in 2018. Um, uh, all the organizations were actually practically involved in the, in the, in the project. Uh, 
including the chamber, but also the trade unions. In 2018, we designed the first project uh, under um, supervision of, of the uh, pharmacies of borders from Canada. Also, we, we work closely with the um, English company ACG Group, who delivered the services in England in 2007 as a training. Uh, and we designed basically a workshop plus the pilot uh, to deliver uh, the training to the pharmacies. Around 770 pharmacies basically uh, took part in the service. Uh, what is good? I mean, we expected that the flu would be the first service to, to, to be provided in the pharmacies. Unfortunately, uh, it didn't happen. So the COVID was the first vaccine that we provided in the pharmacies. So, uh, so um, um, this is this is like what, what, what we've done. And obviously, it was a long effort because it's all started in 2018. But we have now 2022. Uh, uh, just in a moment. Uh, currently, basically, um, uh, all the COVID-19 pandemic was actually shifting uh, lots of changes. First of all, we have uh, uh, pharmacies can prescribe uh, prescriptions to the family up to the third generation back. Uh, all the all the drugs, uh, excluding the control drugs. So it 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 it, it sort of gave us a, a big breath because we could serve our our families. Uh, and, and uh, provide drugs when, when, when GP practices were unavailable. And, and uh, uh, what is a, a great move, in my opinion, so since May 2021, we can, we can basically uh, provide COVID-19 vaccination, plus uh, additional we do qualification. Uh, first, we started in the national vaccination centers. Uh, now, basically, uh, just a month over, so around June, we started to do uh, vaccines in the, in the pharmacies. Uh, uh, next slide, please. So how we done it, because I think this is the most important for the session to, to, to help you to make your own uh, way in your own countries where you are still, I mean, the stakeholders where they are just still struggling to make a final decision. So the Polish drug policy was the most important thing. The EU recommendation, obviously, working with the stakeholders like FIP, uh, also the local uh, local experts. Uh, I just would like to tell you that uh, every year we, call the, we, we hold a conference um, about um, improving immunization uh, rates uh, in, the, in the area of, of the flu in Poland. And two years ago, it was just impossible to convince the doctors and nurses. During the COVID-19, the system realized themselves that uh, it's not capable to cope with this number of, of, of vaccination needed. Uh, so, so we created a coalition on pharmacy-based immunization, where my organization, which I represent the trade union, also the, pharm the pharmacy chamber of Poland, and also some few other organizations are uh, participants. So basically, uh, we have obviously lots of legal constraints on the way, especially the resistance from the doctors and nurses uh, who were feeling like we are taking away the, 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 the money and, and the jobs. Uh, so so it, it's actually, I mean, the COVID-19 help us. So next slide, please. Uh, so uh, the legal changes. Uh, first of all, the, the, one of the most important documents that uh, actually turned turn, turn up in, in 2020 was the Professional, professional Act, uh, where we actually then, uh, designed uh, this service as a, as a vaccination service in the, in the Professional Act. Also some other services like Medicine Use Review and uh, some basic diagnostics um, uh, were mentioned. Also repeat dispensing was there on the list. So it helped a lot, which slightly adjusted the pharmaceutical law and uh, uh, we sort of also created a kind of um, uh, idea how it should be financed from the National Health Fund. So the legal report was ready. The systematic report is, 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 is done and delivered. And now what we do is just advocacy. Uh, execution of the changes, because I think it's also very interesting. Uh, so here it's uh, still ongoing. We are educating pharmacists. Now around 9,000 pharmacists are trained for provision of the COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, they are qualifying plus they are uh, performing vaccines. We created the standards. Actually, some of the standards, most of the standards were, were based on the on the 2019 pilot, which we which we delivered on actually flu, but it, it, it was just a university pilot, um, not really um, uh, done with the government, but with the support of, of different organizations responsible for different stakeholders. So actually, it helped us a lot to, to assess the, 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 the capability to deliver, but also it allowed us to assess the, the, the skills of pharmacists and, and, and um, uh, resistance, because in the, in the study, uh, the, the most important pro, pro, like problem was the training. So uh, after they've been trained, the, the, the motivation has changed. Uh, I would like to just kindly tell you that at the beginning of 2021, uh, and the only 37% of pharmacists declared that they would be happy to deliver vaccines. So it's not it's not very satisfactory for me, but it's changed a lot after after uh, our second study, which we performed like recently. Uh, and now obviously what is the most important is that we are educating, educating and looking for the partners to, to make a coalition. Next slide, please. Uh, so, uh, 
the milestones, because this is something that uh, I should quickly tell you. So obviously the pharmaceutical act, that's the most important document for us to, to show the way it's like a roadmap for pharmacists. Uh, another one is amendments to the act of infectious diseases, where we basically uh, entitled pharmacists for, for the pre-vaccination um, uh, uh, COVID, uh, COVID-19 exam plus the vaccination for COVID-19. Uh, pharmaceutical care pilot, which is now hopefully to, to, to just uh, to approach us shortly in October. We are going to perform the medicine use review project and uh, another few changes uh, establishing a vaccination in, in Poland, the quarter two of 2021. Uh, now, obviously, the, the implementation of the COVID-19 uh, uh, pilot, but uh, the case was that we are planning to have a pilot, but finally it was without a pilot. So we just it was a massive rollout without a pilot, only based on the data that comes from, from other countries. Uh, and now, obviously, we are working to um, uh, put on the list the influenza. Hopefully, the decision is going to be done any any time now. We are just waiting for the for the final decisions, and hopefully, soon from November, we are going to start training against influenza. I think it's it's, it's very beneficial uh, uh, due to the fact that patients are extremely satisfied with what we've done. And obviously, we are going to hopefully we are going to 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 uh, to um, officially basically uh, make a, a, a quota for for reimbursement of this uh, influenza services. Um, so this is something that is happening obviously now. And some few other things uh, um, uh, we are planning obviously in, for 2020 and 2023. Uh, the opportunity that uh, uh, the vaccines can be prescribed by pharmacists, I think it's going to be a good idea, especially now that we are really prescribing a lot for families and and, and up to third generation. So it, it may, the numbers uh, definitely make a, make, make a difference. And uh, the most important uh, thing to tapo, tackle as well in Poland is lifting the ban on advertising in pharmacies. We cannot advertise, for instance, the surgery next to me where I'm just working in a pharmacy can advertise that they are performing vaccines. Unfortunately, me as a pharmacist, I can't. So basically, I'm losing. Uh, so this is something that definitely should be um, um, uh, pro uh, emphasized as an as a, as a, as a obstacle to provide vaccines. Next slide, please. Uh, so, uh, the most important engagement into COVID-19 vaccines, uh, first of all, um, uh, pharmacists can, can vaccine alone, so I can do qualification plus I can do uh, performing the vaccine. Um, uh, the pre-vaccination examination is really easy because it's a standardized questionnaire. Um, uh, we have two steps training based on the on the actually English English uh, uh, requirements and English model, um, and uh, we can just perform vaccination in the pharmacy. the The fee for us is around thirteen euros. Um, as a, as a trade union, we support the concept that it's fifty fifty divided by the pharmacist and the pharmacy owner. Of what I think is a very good uh, very good uh, option for us to get some extra remuneration. And, and all the project is financed fully by the Ministry of Health, including obviously all the materials, uh, needles, syringes, uh, and, and uh, dressing and plasters, uh, all is basic in the package. Next slide, please. Uh, that's the map, how we perform. I believe it's not too bad because we started to do just before the, the vacations. So obviously there was not so many people interested, but currently around uh, uh, 829 pharmacies submitted to the national vaccination project against COVID. And very actively there are 425 engaged pharmacies, 9,000 pharmacies trained, and currently we completed over 70,000 vaccinations against COVID. So I think this is a very good number for us. So that's our country and you can just see how it works. Next slide, please. Uh, Myself, I've just performed also a, a service satisfaction survey. So what I'm really proud of that we monitor uh, pharmacists performing the vaccination uh, vaccination rates in the national vaccination centers that are established by the government, but also in the pharmacies. The percentage is more or less the same. So 90, 94% of uh, nearly, nearly 95% finds it, uh, that vaccination and, uh, done by pharmacists are extremely convenient. 93.5 believes that the pharmacists have skills to administer the vaccines. 90.8 declares that it should be also performed at, at the pharmacy when they're just preparing uh, this questionnaire in the National Vaccination Center. 88.1 think that there should be other vaccinations like, for instance, um, um, uh, influenza or, or pneumonia, pneumococcal, sorry, and, and, and um, um, uh, other vaccines. And so the work in progress, we are still collecting the data. Currently, it was 1,147 people who just uh, decided to answer our question. Next slide, please. Uh, also, we performed a kind of research at the beginning of the year, uh, winter, uh, winter, uh, the end of the 2020 and 2021. 
85% of the people uh, basically um, screened uh, agrees that with the statement that pharmacy are more accessible to the patient than, 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 than GP practice, pardon me. 62% uh, uh, believes that vaccination in the pharmacy would be a quicker and the faster thing. Also, this is now uh, a statement that uh, most of the patients, they say one minute from home and I'm, I'm here. So, so this is excellent. And I think this is something that comes all the time. Uh, also whispering marketing, when they're happy with our service in the pharmacy, they come back and also they bring the families. And very often I'm also acting as an educator and we are acting as an educator among pharmacists who are providing uh, and to convince them that it's in, there's no cheap, there's no artificial intelligence in the, in the, in the vaccine. There's nothing bad about it. It's, 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 it's basically a way to prevent your family and stay healthy for longer. Uh, and uh, the last, the, the last, the last uh, basically, 63% of people uh, uh, definitely uh, they believe and they, they already experience that it's faster than, than going to the GP because here you just step from the street and you are inside. You don't have to book an appointment and it's done straight away. So um, all this, all these things, basically, I think also like my other previous uh, uh, previous guests who were just speaking, research is the key and it's a biggest weapon for me because I, I have collected all the data about it to convince the stakeholder for further changes in the in the Polish vaccination system, which should hopefully include more and more vaccines and also uh, uh, be more important for the government. Next slide, please. So thank you very much for for opportunity to speak and I'm hoping you you enjoy this this presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Piotr, for this very interesting presentation and congratulations on uh, achieving so much in this uh, short period of time. And uh, this is really um, uh, good news uh, for uh, pharmacists around the world that can also copy this, uh, uh, these developments and uh, hopefully for uh, all uh, pharmacists uh, to, to benefit. So um, unfortunately, we do not have uh, time for questions. Uh, we had very um, interesting presentations, uh, but the presenters uh, were kind enough to um, answer the questions that uh, during the session popped up in the Q&A uh, box, uh, except for one last question, which is for Piotr. So I would ask Piotr, if possible, to reply that question directly on the, um, on the chat, uh, on the, uh, chat box as well. Uh, excuse me, on, on the Q&A box as well. So uh, I would like to also thank Stephanie for co-chairing uh, this event and presenting all the speakers and of course all of you for attending. I would invite you to participate in episode four for series two, which is uh, on the 26th of October. Uh, and uh, you can find uh, the link uh, where you can register for all these uh, events in the next slide, uh, or you can scan the QR code um, and you are uh, immediately taken to the uh, events.fip.org uh, website. Uh, you can check uh, uh, all future FIP digital events on that website. And uh, finally, um, I would like to thank you all again for attending uh, all of our speakers for today, congratulating them also on the achievements. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for FIP and Pfizer for providing this opportunity to all pharmacists to uh, participate and uh, to uh, collectively advance vaccination around the world. Thank you again and have a nice day or evening, uh, all of you. I hope to see you uh, next time uh, also at the next FIP digital event. Thank you. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Uh, let me intervene. I see the message of Piotr. He's asking if you can answer a question. And I see he's typing an answer live now. So I can wait before I, uh, before I end the webinar. Is it okay, Piotr, for you? Absolutely. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just sending the message to the, to the person who's interested. Uh, I've sent my email. Uh, if, if you would like to get in touch with me, please, please do. My email is there. Um, I'm happy to answer any kind of questions. Okay. Thank you. All done. Thank All you very much now. for everybody. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you for your participation. Bye-bye. Pleasure.